turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. To the book of Ephesians. I know it's a little, little ways farther than Corinthians, but as we're going to continue on looking at the marriage relationship, actually today you get Christianity 101. This is the basic principle that each one of us should know as a Christian, being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, and actually I'm going to start reading in verse 15 and read down through verse 21. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeem the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. May the Lord bless as we go through His Word. And Paul tells us to be wise and not unwise, or not to be fools. A wise person will use his time here wisely. We don't know how many more days we have before we either are ushered into His presence through death or the rapture. And, and the way things are looking, <laughs> the rapture is not far away. So we need to work while it's still day. Uh, for night is coming. Those seven years are going to be a terrible time. Mm -hmm. Many folks will be saved. Don't get me wrong, but it's going to be a terrible time to endure. Even for the believers, it's going to be a terrible time to endure. A wise person will know the will of the Lord. And, and, and that would be an interesting question to ask everyone. Do you know what the will of the Lord is for your life? Where do we find the will of the Lord? We find it in the Word of the Lord. There we go, Janet. She's raised in her Bible. That's exactly. You'll find the will of the Lord. Sometimes he just says, this is the will of the Lord. And one of those is giving thanks. <laughs> and this is God's will for us. And we'll look at that next week. A wise person will live a spirit-controlled life. And as we go through the marriage relationship and family relationships, Paul makes sure that he establishes this principle to be filled with the Spirit. If we want to be the husband, the wife, the parent, the pastor, the worker, <laughs> every part of life, the Spirit wants to be involved in every part of your life, 24-7, seven, seven days a week, the rest of your life as a believer. And because, you know, you have an enemy that's on, on duty, what, 24-7, the rest of your life while you're here upon this earth. And without the power of the Spirit, we can't defeat the enemy. That's right. And we need to remember that. And we can't be the person that God's called us to be without His empowerment in our lives. And that's one of the blessings that the church enjoys since the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit coming to live within us to empower us to live the life that Jesus Christ asks us to live. To be the witness we should be. Paul shares this again before we get into relationships. And uh, throughout this letter, he shared throughout the book of Ephesians and throughout all of his letters, he shares the importance of dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Christians cannot walk in humility, unity, separation, light, love, and wisdom apart from the energizing of the Holy Spirit. A little story here about a guy named Gypsy Smith. Gypsy, his real name was Rodney Smith, a remarkable person who was born in a gypsy tent in the parish of Wanstead near Epping Forest, England. He turned out to be one of the world's most remarkable evangelists. Interestingly enough, he received no education. His mother died of smallpox when he was a boy. When Rodney was in his teens, his father was saved. Later, uh, as he was married, he went out and preached to his first group of 1,500 people. And he wrote these words. Let the beauty of 
Jesus be seen in me, all his wonderful passion and purity. O thou Spirit divine, all my nature refine to the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. And am I telling you that education is not valuable? No, I'm not. But when it comes to spiritual truths and spiritual things, we have the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. And He can take a shepherd boy <laughs> and turn him into a king. Into a man who is after God's own heart. He can do that to every one of us. What I'm saying is, oh, you, oh, I haven't been to seminary. I haven't been to Bible college. Well, you know what? You've got this book right here. And if you're a believer, you've got the Holy Spirit living inside you. Don't give me no excuses. <laughs> Don't give me no excuses. Paul says you got everything you need. Peter tells us that. And so uh, Gypsy Smith had learned that thing, that if he allows the Holy Spirit to take over, people start seeing Christ instead of him. And God gifts some of the folks to be great evangelists. And we've known a few in our time, right? One of the greatest evangelists ever. Billy Graham. Yeah. We have Franklin Graham, who's quite an evangelist. Uh, and Graham Lotz. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Greg Laurie, who's with... Uh, uh, yes, he is a wonderful evangelist. God has just blessed those folks. We're all supposed to be evangelists, but some people God seems to have gifted with the gift of evangelism, and it seems like they can share something, and people listen, and the Holy Spirit takes it and drives it home, and people get saved. Uh, so God may be wanting to use you in that fashion, so we need to be spirit-filled believers. And it's the essential principle for every born-again believer. Paul says in verse 18, And do not be drunk with wine. Now the Bible never does tell us that we can't have a drink of wine, but it says we shouldn't be what? Drunk. Because then alcohol takes over. And Paul says, just the same way alcohol takes over, he wants us to live a life that the Holy Spirit takes over. And he changes us. The drinking part was a problem in the Ephesus community. I think it's a problem in America today. I'm disappointed in so many things. They, they don't want to show cigarette commercials on TV anymore, but you can't watch a sporting event that's not bombarded with alcohol. Mm -hmm. And alcohol kills a lot of people, wrecks a lot of families, wrecks a lot of relationships. And I think that we ought to do more to curbing that instead of promoting that, but that's, that's, that's my soapbox. Um, their religion uh, there in Ephesus was centered around drunken and moral orgies of supposed ecstasy in which a person tried to progressively elevate himself into communion with the gods. Small G. <laughs> but Paul says a drunken life will lead to a life which is dissipation in the New King James, debauchery in several, excess in the King James, the New Living Translation, I think, translates it wonderful to a ruined life. So that word dissipation uh, kind of tells you <laughs> that the things you do just will kind of be worthless. It's, an, it's a wasted life. It's indulgent and sensual pleasure <coughs> to lead away from morality or duty. And as I share with you, drunk is totally controlled by the alcohol. His mind, his emotions, and his will. If you've never been on that side of the coin, praise God. <laughs> but tell you from the side that, of us that have been there, I told you I learned to drink from eight, eight months old. And I, by eight years old, I was getting too drunk and standing up and peeing my pants. Alcohol controlled my life at that time. They would maybe do things, say things that I normally would not. I Usually at eight years old, you're not walking around peeing your pants. I tell you. But that's what alcohol does to you. It messes you up. And it messes up your thinking. You cry. You do angry things. You just do all kinds of... And that's what happens when alcohol gets a hold of you. And you lose self-control. Uh, I did things when I was drunk that I never would have done sober, let me tell you. Uh, I 
paid the price for some of those. <laughs> but uh, it is amazing uh, what alcohol will do. And, and I'm not telling you those things to promote them. I'm telling you that Paul says, I want you to be filled with the Spirit so that he takes over in such a way that he controls your mind, your emotion, and your will. And we know that our emotions can really drag us down the wrong direction. And even the Holy Spirit can help us there. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Number one, it's not an option. It's a command. <laughs> it's given to us in the imperative form. It is a command. Every born-again believer should be Spirit-filled. It's plural, so that means it's to all of us, not just a select few. Every one of us sitting here as believers, young, old, whatever, male, female, present tense. It's something that we have to continually do. Keep on being filled. Keep on being filled. It's in the passive tense, and that's what happens with the original language. There's a whole lot more going on than what we read in the English. But in the passive tense, it's something that's done to us, not something that I do to myself. It is something that's done to me. The Holy Spirit does this to me. He fills me. He takes over control in my life. It connotes more than filling something up as when someone pours water into a glass up to the rim. In 2 Peter 1.21, it's used about a wind filling a sail and thereby carrying the ship along. And you know that a, a, a sailboat without wind is what? Useless. <laughs> And that wind fills those sails and pushes it along. And that's what the Holy Spirit will do to us. As it fills us, He will, will move us and motivate us to live godly lives to reflect Jesus Christ. It carries the idea of also a permeation. The same way that salt permeates meat in order to flavor it and to preserve it. And it, uh, if you've eaten things like jerky, <laughs> um, but if you've ever eaten fish that have been treated with salt. Uh, we used to do that when I was in my early days. We used to drink beer and eat fish because that salt would make you thirsty. And then we'd drink beer and then after a while you didn't care what you was eating. <laughs> when I look at them sober, I say, ooh, I don't know why I ate those. But God wants His Holy Spirit to so permeate the lives of His children that everything they think, say, and do reflect His divine presence. So when they look at you, they see Jesus. And that's what we want to do. That word filled there actually be translated controlled. Total control. Dominated. And the Bible wants the Holy Spirit to dominate us. And I'm going to keep on driving this home. We want to be known for a spirit-filled life. In Luke chapter 4, verse 28, it says, And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. <laughs> and you're going to see there, speaking of their anger towards the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll act upon it. They were controlled by their anger. That's the same word. Acts 13, 45, When the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. They were what? Controlled by their jealousy. Ephesians 5.18, translated for us by Kenneth Wiest, who is a wonderful Greek scholar, said, but be constantly controlled by the Holy Spirit. That something has to be happening all the time. Practicing the presence of God. Just as a drunk is controlled by alcohol, believers should be by the Spirit. And unless we are filled by the Spirit, we will live lives in spiritual weakness. Retardation. Otherwise, our spiritual growth will be very, very slow, if at all. Because you will not grow without the Spirit's help. And, and that's why I say this is one-on-one -on -one stuff. This is stuff that we need to know as Christians. Otherwise, we're going to Never grow. Never be what God wants us to be as a church. Unless the Holy Spirit takes over. And the way into the life that's frustration. I can't do that. You know what? You can't. <laughs> Remember that. You can't. But Jesus can do it through you. Amen. Amen. I 
can't witness to that person. Yes, you can. The Holy Spirit will give you the power to witness for Him. I don't know what to say. You know what? I even believe He'll, as long as you have prepared yourself and you know some scriptures, that He'll use and He'll bring forth to your memory exactly what you need. How will you respond in that situation if you find out something that's terrible news? You know what? You can get through it with the Lord Jesus Christ's help through the power of the Spirit. He's there. But it's frustrating if you try to do it on your own. If you try to do the first two commandments that Jesus said, well, to love the Lord your God with all your soul, heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, that one's a tough one right there. I'll guarantee that without one, within one week, not any of us that here can do that one perfectly. Because somebody will cut you off when you leave here, and you're thinking, all right, all right praise the Lord. Right? <laughs> you're giving him a high sign. The California high. <laughs> and you're upset. And all of a sudden, you don't love him so much. But that's what happens when, we'll see, as the flesh takes over. The spirit would look at that, you know, praise God that I missed him. <laughs> that he missed me. Uh, you know, if he had to cut in front of me to get in line, well, praise well, I guess he must have needed it worse than I did. Is it really going to make that much difference? And uh, that's the difference, what happens, and defeat. And we see a lot of defeated Christians today. People want to quit. And here, we claim we have this most awesome God, <laughs> the Savior who loved me so much that he died for me, and now the Holy Spirit living in me, and all of a sudden I'm defeated all the time. Now I'm going to tell you that we're going to always live on the victory side. No, we don't always. We can. It's there. But we will stumble once in a while. You'll have a bad day once in a while and things just won't work out quite right, but that's all right. We're, we just sang a song, it's a wonderful song, Grace, Grace, Marvelous Grace, Greater Than What? All Our Sins. Amen. And we'll look at that as we go along. So, it involves a day-by-day, -day, moment by moment submission to the Spirit's control. Moment by moment. And, and, and it gets... I believe a little easier as you walk with the Lord. And really what we're going to be looking at is keeping short accounts of sin and the intake of the Scripture in our lives as we go along with see. Turn with me back just a, a, a few pages to uh, Galatians chapter 5. And, and this is kind of fun. Tom's not here today, so I'm going to talk about him. <laughs> Tom and I, Tom accepted the Lord here at the church, and him and I did a private Bible study. And so we talked about these two verses. But he's telling me, he said, You want to? He said, I got this struggle going on. I said, Good. Because <laughs> if we got no struggle, we got a problem. But here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Now, Paul could have said what? Be filled with the Spirit. Taught the same thing. John calls it walking in fellowship. Walking in the light. Jesus said this way, abide in Christ. Practicing the presence of the indwelling Holy Spirit 24-7. He says, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And most Christians get this backwards. They try to stop the lust of the flesh so that they're walking in the Spirit. Get backwards. You will not have victory over the flesh without the Spirit's help. Put Him in control. <laughs> Another verse we're talking about on Wednesday nights about Satan is to submit yourself to God. Then resist the devil and he will flee. So we get our life right with Him, with the Holy Spirit leading our lives, and we'll have victory over the flesh over the world, and over the devil. <laughs> there it is. Real simple principle, as we see. But in practice, sometimes it's harder. He goes on to say, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, Paul says that the Spirit will take you in a new direction in life, but you're going to have a battle going on. 
just as well as the Holy Spirit is telling you to do good, <laughs> the flesh, which will be energized through Satan and the world, will be telling you to do the wrong side. Uh, it, it's just like we used to think of the devil sitting here and saying, you know, you go ahead and do that. And the Holy Spirit said in here and said, no, you better not do that. You know better than that. I've taught you better than that. I will give you the power to not go there. But the flesh is weak. <laughs> and it gives in to those urges and those temptations. You might well say, well, the, how do I know if I'm operating in the flesh? Well, Paul gave us a list here. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. It's not too hard to see fleshly people. Especially if you've been saved. When I see drunks now, I see them totally different than when I was one of them. When I see people involved in sinful habits in this world today, I totally see them different than I used to. Now God still wants me to look on those people with compassion because they only know to do what they are programmed to do. And if you're not saved, you're programmed to do these things. It says, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelry, and the like. So this isn't a complete list. <laughs> Paul said, so you get in the message here, the people that live like this, he said, they're being controlled by the flesh. And, and you don't have to look too far in America today to see that. You see the, the, what they're doing in protests and things today, not just about the elections, but all the way through the Black Lives Matter thing and all the, through the LBGT thing, riots and protests. People destroying property. We even get it in today when someone wins or loses a football game. Who, who tells them to do that? The flesh does. <laughs> the flesh says get rowdy like that. Let's drink some alcohol and have fun and smoke some dope and take some pills and tear up the town and turn over the police cars. And that's fun. That's fun. <laughs> At somebody else's expense. That's what the flesh does. It doesn't look at how it affects someone else. It just looks at my desires, my will, my pleasures, and doesn't take into consideration other people. And Paul goes on to say, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't tell me you live like the devil and you're going to heaven. Did you know what? John calls him a liar. He says, if you have no sin, <laughs> you say you have no sin, you're a liar. Okay. And the truth is not in you. Don't tell me about who God accepts and who He doesn't. He's told me, and He never changes, and this is the way it is. If you live like this, He says, or you practice these things, that means they're a part of your everyday life, then you've got a spiritual problem that needs to be dealt with. So that's the flesh. Now, what am I going to look like once I get saved and the Holy Spirit takes over? Well, there's these two beautiful verses here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against us there is no law. Wow! That's the same bunch that was over here that are now saved that were rowdy, drinkers, alcoholics, druggies, <laughs> sexual perverts, let's just put it that way. And now all of a sudden they've learned to control their passions and their desires. They've learned to love one another. And they're patient with people, long-suffering. You know, that's a hard one for all of us, isn't it? Being patient with people. Because we have higher expectations maybe sometimes for them than what Maybe even the Lord has. <laughs> well, we at least have a short expectation of how, how long it's going to take them to get there. Some people progress faster in their spiritual life. Some people slower. Part of it is because they haven't been taught. They don't know the Word of God. They don't understand the principle that we're talking about today about walking and being filled with the Spirit. And so their life is slowed down. It's 
statement. It's not ruling. And that's what we want to do as a church and as a church family. So, I either am, as a Christian, I'm either walking in the flesh or the sinful nature, it says in the NIV, or I am walking in the spirit. So the question to ask ourselves, what changes commanders? What changes me from walking in the spirit to walking in the flesh? Or what changes me from walking in the flesh to be walking in the Spirit. I'm glad to have First John. One of our memory verses, First John 1.9. Oh, yeah. We're, we're going to look there. That's why I said this is such a critical verse also. First John 1.9. Actually, we're going to start in verse 5. John, who to- tells us what it's like to have touched the Lord Jesus and to fellowship with Him. He says, truly, true Christian fellowship is with the Lord Jesus. Christ and around what he's done for us. And sometimes that's lacking in, in our, uh, our fellowships today. But what about the Lord? What's going on in your life about the Lord? <laughs> Instead of just the football and just the weather and just, you know, all of our problems. What's going on in the Lord? How is the Lord giving you victory over those problems? Uh, maybe you can be honest enough to say, you know what, I stumbled this week. A couple words came out of my mouth that shouldn't come out of my mouth. <laughs> but I dealt with that and uh, you know, I'm moving on because you know we don't always live in victory like I said that's because he understands that we're but flesh uh, but he's given us the power to overcome that I don't want to make excuses for it but in verse 5 he says this is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all and we could take and take that word light and put in there holy or without sin. He's pure. He's holy. He's without sin. And in him is no darkness at all. Why does there's no because there is no sin in him. There was no sin in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no sin in God the Father. And why do we call the Spirit? We call him what? Holy Spirit, because he's without what? Without yeah. sin. It says if say we have fellowship with him, God the Father and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Otherwise, if you have sin in your life, your fellowship with the Lord is broken. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not severed. You still are a child of God. And you've had this with your spouses, you've had it with your children. When you're married, you have a spat, and you may not be talking but you're still what? You're still married. That child may be a black sheep of the family, but guess what? He's still part of the family. Oh, you can disinherit him and this, this, and all that, but he's still what? He's still part of the family. And that's the way it is when you're born into the family of God. The Bible says that when we're born, we are the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. That's called indwelling. We're never commanded to be indwelt. That happens at salvation. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, 2 Corinthians, anyhow. Several places teach that. And it says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He comes to live in there, it says in Ephesians, to the day of redemption. So one day when we go to be with the Lord and that old sinful nature is gone, we won't need the Holy Spirit to live inside of us because we won't have that threat of the flesh and the old nature to pull us the wrong direction. And he says, so if he says, uh, if we have fellowship with him and walk in sin, we're lying. You don't have true fellowship. You don't have that intimate relationship that you need to have, that closeness. You're not paying attention to what he says. It says, but if we walk in the light without known sin, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Verse 9. If you're walking in the flesh, and you've got known sin in your life, here you go. If we what? Confess Confess our sin. That word confess means to agree with. To say the same thing. Otherwise, don't tell me it's a sickness and don't make excuses. God said to sin, say yes, and name it. (laughs) I lied. Lord, would you please what? Forgive me. 
But it goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, I lied. <laughs> I confess that before you and I ask that you forgive me. And you know what? If you truly mean it from your heart, guess what he does? He, he cleanses you and purifies you. It's like giving you a bath. My wife can relate to that because she has about, she's, you know, she's like myself. We're a shower a day at least, people. She's even more than that sometimes. And so Saturday after yesterday, I gave her her bath, and she just was enjoying the feeling of being clean and having clean hair. I don't have to worry about that so much. But <laughs> the clean part, doesn't it feel good to get a shower and feel refreshed? Well, that's just what happens when the Lord forgives you of your sin and cleans it. It's wiped out. It's gone. It's paid for as far as the east is from the west. It's gone. And you're, you're set free. No guilt. Now, there could be consequences. Confession and forgiveness doesn't mean we erase all consequences. That's a false statement. <laughs> Now, God's grace may lessen the consequences. I believe that. But there's still always a, a, a consequence to sin. And certain sins have more serious consequences. Uh, we've known folks that have been to prison for life for killing somebody and getting saved while in prison. Pray God for that. Because where are they going to be? With us in eternity one day. But you know what? They may never come out of those doors in the prison. Because that's the consequence of their sin. And that's what we've done in America today. We want to take away the consequences of people's sin. You can't do that. There's always a payday for sin. And I'm glad that the Lord Jesus Christ paid for my sins at Calvary's cross. And he said, if you'll come to me and confess them, our relationship will be restored. Close. Pretty simple principle. Walking in fellowship with God. No known sin. And you say, well, what if I did something and I didn't know about it? I'll guarantee you the Holy Spirit will let you know when you cross over the line. He will convict you of what, Greg? Sin? Yeah, righteousness? Sin, righteousness. Amen. You hear, Greg, you hear Greg say that often. Sin, righteousness. And the Holy Spirit's great at it. Why? Because he's perfect. He's God. And he knows just how hard to poke. Just how hard to whack. And I told you some of us take bigger hammers than others. But he will get the point across. And you'll have no excuse saying, well, I didn't know that. And he'll tell you, you're a liar. Amen. He'll point right in your finger and he says, I told you that. <laughs> I won't let you sleep over it. Deal with it. That's the key of being a successful Christian and a mature Christian. Dealing with sin the moment that it's brought to your mind. If you hear one of those words come out of your mouth, right then say what? Father, forgive me. Give me strength not to say that again. And whether that's a cuss word or it's gossip, <laughs> backbiting, whatever it may be, when he puts his finger on it, deal with it. Lord, I should have never looked at that photo. When you're looking on the internet, it's very tough sometimes not to see things that are very inappropriate. They pop up everywhere. Lord, that was not a good photo for my mind to take in. Would you please forgive me and wipe that up stuff out of my mind? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's what we want to... That, that's a, a Christian that's walking with the Lord. The Holy Spirit wants us to keep confession in the back of our mind, to surrender our will, our intellect, our body, time, talent, possession, and desire. Remember, God always wants all of you, your time, your talent, and your treasure. I'm just going to share these couple of things with you because we don't have time to go to them. But in Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, it tells us that a spirit-controlled person be a person who is filled with the Word of God. It says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. That means to be at home, to settle in. Not just the surface reading of the Scriptures, but I'm talking, thinking about it, meditating on it, seeing it apply to your life. And it will change you through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Remember, the Holy Spirit will never lead you contrary to the Word of God. If someone tells you that, they're wrong. It's impossible. It's impossible. He says the evidence there in Ephesians, as I finish up with you, uh, he says, how do I know that these people are spirit filled? He says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says you'll have uh, a song on your lips. The songs that says there were put to music. We still have some today, but we, we even sing uh, Create Me a Clean Heart, Psalm 51. Lots of songs that we sing. And that's what we're talking about here. Scriptural songs sung with music. Uh, hymns. Songs of praise. Uh, that are addressed directly to God, like How Great Thou Art. Or that song, Praise Him, Praise Him, Tell of His Excellent Greatness. Yeah, those kind of songs. Spiritual songs, songs of testimony like I'd Rather Have Jesus or Amazing Grace. Uh, the song we sang this morning would be on the first one where it's, Oh, Marvelous Grace, talking about God's grace and how Mark, talking about His nature and exalting Him. Spiritual songs, choruses, making melody in my heart. I'm talking about playing music. Larry did that this morning. He played the music as unto the Lord, and that's where that word comes out of there. So I want you to ask this question, does the music I listen to honor the Lord? It's a question to ask ourselves about our music. I'm not saying you can't listen to something, but as a habit, as a avenue of spiritual learning and growth, are you listening to good music? Does it draw me close to the Lord, or does it appeal to my flesh? He says in verse 19 that to be joyful. Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my joy. You know, it is, it's wonderful to be in a right relationship with God and know Him. Because He blesses you with the joy, an inner calmness, an inner peace that's unexplainable. And you can see people when they have the Lord controlling their life. You can see it even in tense situations. He says the next one there, as I wind up, uh, here, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at that more next week. But a Warren Wiersbe said this, Thank and think come from the same root word. If we would think more, we would thank more. But we, we, we ought to be a very thankful people. Mm -hmm. We should be. We should be thankful for America. We should be thankful for our family, thankful for our church family, thankful for our salvation. It goes on and on. And I'm waiting to hear from you next week and some things you're thankful for as we praise God for the things He gives us. And then He says when we work in relationships, we need to be filled with the Spirit and have that attitude of humility, verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And we'll pick up on that when we get back to the marriage thing with the Lord week after next.